All right, so let's go ahead and get started with networking 101. We'll go over the basics of networking, we'll get started so you can start getting comfortable with the concepts of networking here. Today we're going to talk about what the client server model is, also different network topologies, you know, what these are, different types of networks. We'll also talk about IP addresses briefly, we'll get into more detail in later classes here. And then we'll also talk about DNS, the importance of the DNS host file as well. Okay, so what is a network? If you think about a network, it's just devices that are connected to other devices. So a network, by definition, requires at least two devices. If you have a computer connected to another computer somehow, that's a network. It's a very small network, but it is a network. Sometimes when we think of networks, we think of our work or our Wi-Fi networks at home where we think about the internet in general. So having multiple devices connected to each other creates a network. Now, networks generally have, you know, multiple de devices, as we talked about. They also have resources, so we can serve files, websites. You can check your email. You can request video. So things like Gmail, YouTube, Google.com, these are all resources that we can access. And then we have services. These are things like online shopping, online gaming, video conferencing, things like that. So networks, they're one or the other type of a network. So there's something called a wide area network and a local area network. On your home network, when you you take your phone and you connect it to your Wi-Fi network, that is a local area network. The reason is it's local and everything inside can talk to each other. The wide area network is a bigger network, generally the internet as we know it. So anything local inside your home or inside a business this is a local area network. A wide area network allows public resources to communicate with other public resources. A couple examples, so local area network, you might have your printer, you might have your phone, your laptop on a local area network. A wide area network might consist of Facebook or Google or Amazon or maybe Netflix. These are all things that are publicly available. A local area network can only be accessed if you are on that network. The wide area network or resources on the wide area network can be accessed no matter where you're at. Now let's talk about the client server model. So every time you request something on the internet, the client server model allows us to access these resources. So let's take this example. We have a client which is our computer and we're requesting a website. The server gives us the website. So it's a request and a response. The client is the um, you know, the machine or the computer requesting the resource, and the server is what is serving the resource. And this resource can really be anything. This can be a file, a video, a website, etc. So here's another example here. So the client here is our computer, or it could even be our browser, uh, Google Chrome or Firefox. And the client is requesting us to show this video on YouTube. So the YouTube server responds with the video, so we're able to see the video. Okay, let's talk about network security briefly. So with network security, we always have to think about the CIA triad, integrity, availability, and confidentiality. So with integrity, we need to make sure data is sent, but it's the same as when we sent it. So we need to make sure it's not tampered with before it gets to the end, the recipient. We also need to make sure resources are available. So there are things called denial of service attacks. If you overwhelm a resource, you can send a lot of packets at it. You can actually bring those resources down. And then confidentiality. We want to make sure people only have access to the things that they should have access to. So we want to use things like encryption to make sure everything's secure in transit. Okay, let's talk about network topologies here. We're not going to talk too much about this. We'll go over this just because this is something that's covered in interviews and just kind of good to know. So a ring network is where each computer is connected to the one next to it and another one next to it. So each device is connected to two. And so if you want to send something across the network, it has to go through other hosts. This isn't very common, but it's an older type of network. The way this works is each device has a token and it passes it around very fast, which essentially gives each computer the opportunity to take a turn to send something across the network. So a star topology or start network, this is what we're all familiar with. This is where all devices connect to one device to access the network. So in the center there, this might be seen as a router 
and all of these other ones on the outside can be devices. So all of our phones and laptops are connected to our router, one device, which then connects us to the internet. A bus network, essentially there's just one uh, line that all these devices connect to, and this allows them to access the network. Still in use, there are use cases, but not something you're gonna be using on your home network. A fully connected network, this is where every device is connected to every other device. It's really good for reducing downtime, making sure resources are available, but it's also very resource intensive. And then the other one we're gonna talk about here is line. This is where in order to send something across the network, you have to send it through other hosts. It's kind of like ring, but the ring comes full circle. Line is just going in one direction. There are other ones called tree, networks, things like that. We're not gonna get into that. So as we talked about, the star network is probably the most common type of network we're used to. As I said, the Wi-Fi router is generally what we're all connected to on our home networks. Okay, now let's talk about network devices. I'm sure a lot of these devices will uh, be familiar to a lot of us. So the first one we're gonna talk about here is a router. A router connects networks to other networks. If you think about it, your phone or your laptop is connecting to your router, right? Your home router, with Wi-Fi, and that home router is actually connecting you to the internet, which is another network. So your local area network, which is your internal network, is only able to talk to the wide area network or the internet because of your router. So your router allows your internal network to communicate with the wide area network or the internet as we know it. Two different networks, so the router bridges those two together. If this were inside of an enterprise, you might have different buildings. So you might have building A, building B, and building C. And so if you wanted to talk to a computer on building C, you could use a router to connect these different networks within the buildings to each other. So for example, building A might have its own router, building C might have it, and building B might have their own. So building B's router would have to talk to building A's router so you could uh, get across there. And then we have a network switch. So a switch allows devices on a local area network to talk to each other. We're gonna get into more detail about this. So routers allow you to connect networks to each other. Switches allow devices on the local area network to talk to each other. So this allows your printer to talk to your iPhone, which allows your iPhone to talk to your computer, which allows you to talk to your tablet, things like that. Now we have a modem. So a modem translates different signals into a readable type of signal for your network. So when internet signals are sent over the cable or via satellite, these signals have to be translated into an internet signal. So a lot of you may have used satellite internet or cable internet or fiber, which uses light, and then DSL. They're just sending ones and zeros over these cables. And then the modem is gonna translate it into something that your network can actually understand. And then inside of your your phone, your laptop, your tablet, all of your internet connected devices, even your printer, is probably something called a network interface card or a NIC. This allows that device to connect to a network. A lot of the times it might have an ethernet port or it could just be a wireless NIC. And that brings us to wireless access points. So WAPs or wireless access points allow us to connect to a network wirelessly. And then we have firewalls. These can be hardware or software, but in this case, I'm gonna demonstrate a hardware version of a firewall. This is something that's put in between routers generally, and so it's ab able to filter packets uh, in and out of the network. So now we have load balancers. So load balancer can actually distribute uh, network traffic across several servers, so no one server takes all the traffic. Let's say you have a website, and it can only handle about 10,000 visitors at one time. If all 10,000 users were visiting your website at a given time, or more, it would bring your website down. So a load balancer is something that can actually spread out the traffic and you can have multiple instances of your website. So you might have one server here, another server here, and the load balancer would actually choose strategically where to place those users there. So it's just a way of making sure one server doesn't become overwhelmed. Okay, now let's talk about um, IP addresses and MAC addresses here. So IP addresses are like addresses for devices on your network. These can be internal or external. So it's just like an address. If you want to send something to a different server, if you want to send something to Google Drive, you need to know the IP address to send it to. Now there are different things that make this easy so we don't have to memorize IP addresses, but this is essentially what an IP address is. It's an address that's unique to a certain device. Let's talk about private IP addresses. These 
are for LANs, local area networks. So private IP addresses are in your home network or they're in your enterprise or your business or you know an agency. Different things where you have like an organization. So these are internally used. So multiple different businesses could use these and they wouldn't collide with each other. The reason is these IP address ranges are reserved for internal use. So if business A is in Utah, they could use this range of you know 10.0.0.0. And then let's say business B is in Colorado, they could also use this internal address 10.0.0.0. The reason they're allowed to use that is because these IP addresses are not accessible to the public. These are only inside of local area networks. So if you're working at company A and you're sending an email internally to a different employee, it would be sending it to an internal IP address. It wouldn't be exiting that local area network. It wouldn't be crossing the internet. Now a public IP address is accessible to everything or everyone on the internet. Think about google.com or Facebook or Amazon. These are all publicly accessible and they all have public IP addresses. These IP addresses do not fall in these private address ranges. So anything outside of this is generally going to be accepted as a public IP address. Let's talk about MAC addresses briefly. So MAC addresses theoretically are permanent because they are stamped onto the network interface card. The first three bits are actually reserved for the manufacturer. So if you Google the first three bits of a device, you can actually find out, is this an Intel card or is this an Apple device, right? Or is this a Cisco device? The last three are theoretically unique. So the first three you can tell what the manufacturer is, the last three will uh, be a unique identifier for that network interface card. Now there's something called DNS here. So DNS actually translates IP addresses as we talked about into human readable um, names that we can remember. So if I do something called NS lookup google.com, it's gonna give us google.com, but it's also gonna give us the IP address for google.com. So this is going to give us the current IP address of Google. So if we type that in, you know, theoretically, we could probably get that website there. We don't want to have to remember 172.217.10.78. Plus, Google has multiple IP addresses that they own, so we don't want to keep track of all these. This is why we use something called DNS, which is Domain Name Service. So this translates IP addresses into um, host names or domain names. Another thing to keep in mind with DNS is there are servers out on the internet that our computers reach out to, and it's going to query those servers to say, okay, what is the, the IP address for this name? Before it actually talks to those servers, there are multiple steps here. One place it checks is your browser cache first. It checks your browser to see, has it actually cached it first? Because if it looked it up previously, it'll just store it there and say, oh, I know exactly where google.com is. It's at 172.217.10.78. So Firefox or Chrome or Safari, it's going to tell you that's where it is. You don't have to query those servers online. Now, if it's not in your browser cache, it's gonna check something called your host file on your computer. So if it's not able to find it in the browser, it's gonna query your host file. So a host file has a list of different IP addresses and hosts. So on here, let me go ahead and actually cut out the Etsy hosts file. So if you look here, these are some of the IP addresses. This is actually a local loopback address. We'll talk about that later. 127.0.0.1 actually means this device or local host. So if you type in local host, it's going to translate to 127.0.0.1. Now, if we wanted to put this in here, we could actually put 172.217.10.78 in this host file and have it translate to Google if we wanted it permanent there. Generally, we don't want to do that, but there's also you know, a chance that someone could compromise this Etsy host file. So if someone were to compromise it, we could do something like this. Oops. Okay, so I'm gonna edit this file as a malicious user. So let's say you've compromised a system and you wanna redirect traffic to a different location. Uh, so let's do 137.74, 187.102. 
And there's a website called Krebs on Security. It's a security blog. Oops, for some reason my keyboard is not working here. Krebs on security.com. So what this will do is when someone types in Krebs on security.com, it's going to send them to this IP address regardless of if it's actually the right place. Because remember, it checks your browser. If it's not there, it's going to check here. And then once it finds it, it stops its search. After that, it's going to reach out to like your router or another DNS server out on the internet. Okay, so today we talked about the client server model. We also talked about different network topologies, briefly talked about IP addresses, and then we talked about DNS and the host file a little bit today. We'll get into more detail on that. Uh, really hope you're enjoying these videos. We'll get more into networking in the following videos. So stay tuned and uh, we'll see you later. Bye.